Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Recognizing Anxiety in Youth. Today's webinar is presented by Angela Bigress, and um, my name is Ann Chensky, and I will be one of the moderators for today's webinar. Sarah McMinn will also be moderating the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Great Lakes MHTTC uh, and SAMHSA. A little bit about us is the Great Lakes ATTC, MHTTC, and PTTC are funded by SAMHSA. We are funded under the following cooperative agreements. This presentation was prepared for the uh, Great Lakes MHTTC under those cooperative agreements, and the opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official position of DHHS or SAMHSA. Just a couple housekeeping details. Certificates of attendance will be emailed to you. Um, it could take up to two weeks. You can use the Q&A section to ask Angela questions and they will be answered at the end of the webinar. If you're having technical issues, um, please individually message either Stephanie Bellman or Christina Spanbauer and they will be happy to help you. You can get to them in the chat section. Um, if you're interested in any of the other presentations or activities that we have, please feel free to visit us on social media. And our speaker today is Angela Bigress, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to introduce her. Thank you, Anne. Um, Angela, we are so excited to have you here today. Uh, so Angela is a licensed clinical social worker who did her training at the University of Chicago, where she obtained her MSW. She is an experienced trainer and presenter, contracted both independently and through various nonprofits in the Chicago area, Michigan, and others, with experience integrating mental health education programs into the curriculum for students and staff within the Chicago and West Cook County Public Schools. In partnership with the National Alliance for Mental Health, Metro Suburban, Angela also developed a program to help decrease student stress and implement mindfulness in classrooms. She has also worked with Chicago Family Services, providing parent education with efforts to get parents reunited with their children. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Angela Pigres, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I work for Partners for Healthy Lives, and I promote and provide a lot of mental health education in our communities. Um, I also do counseling and therapy for young adults and adolescents. And we're here today to learn a little bit more about recognizing anxiety in youth. So I'm really happy to be here with everyone and we're gonna get started. So here's an overview of what we will be learning today throughout the course, throughout the hour. We're gonna talk a little bit about what is anxiety and the different types of anxiety, what is healthy and unhealthy anxiety. I will also talk about what are some signs and symptoms of anxiety in youth. And then we're going to learn some strategies that we can use for students in the school. I will also be talking a little bit more about how we can support youth and ourselves as schools reopen this year, keeping in consideration that this year is a little bit different due to COVID. And then I will end by talking about uh, when to seek help, what to expect when we do seek help, and then some available resources. But before we get started, I would like to see who is in the room. So I'm going to um, put up a poll just to see what is your role um, in your community. So if you can all please take a minute just to answer this poll.
All right. So let's share the results. Okay, it looks like we have mostly social workers, we have some teachers, parents, and then the majority are others. So for all of you who chose other, can you tell me what is your role with youth? You can write that on the chat. Okay, therapists, prevention program coordinator, project coordinators, okay, school-based counselors, All right. This is great. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so it looks like we have a lot of knowledge in the room as well, and that's gonna be really helpful throughout the course. Um, all right, so thank you all for participating. It's helpful to kind of get an idea who is here, um, and then that way we can provide some more specific resources and examples. All right, so let's keep going. Um, so before we start talking about anxiety, I think it's really important to talk about resiliency and self-care. So most people are impacted by mental health at some point in their lives, and personal resiliency is an important skill. We know that adults and youth tend to be very resilient, especially adolescents tend to be um, are very, very resilient and oftentimes are able to kind of come back to their typical self despite a lot of their changes. And so when we think about that, the word resiliency is the ability for something to kind of bounce back. And with adolescents, despite all of the changes that happen during adolescence, like puberty and um, changes through school and home environment, we know that they oftentimes can bounce back and are able to successfully go through those adolescent years and be uh, successful adults. However, self-care is really important for us to be resilient. And the best way for us to teach self-care is through modeling it. So before we even get started talking about anxiety, I want us to think about our own self-care. And I want you to think about what is one small thing you will do today to practice self-care. And if we can share that with the whole group, that would be really helpful. We can all use some ideas and tips to add to our toolbox on how to practice self-care for ourselves, especially considering that we have a lot of people who are in the helping profession. Uh, so I say go to bed on time, take lunch, absolutely. Uh, physical activity, we're actually gonna talk about physical activity a little bit. Yoga, sleep, I see sleep a lot. Good, thank you. These are all really helpful skills. All right, so let's go on and talk a little bit more about the prevalence of anxiety. So anxiety disorders affect approximately six to 10% of youth, and it's one of the most common mental health disorders. In an average class, two to three students may experience anxiety-related anxiety symptoms, and anxiety disorders frequently originate during childhood and adolescence. However, anxiety is often undiagnosed and most children with anxiety never receive treatment. So for all of you who are here, why do you think some young people, or why do you think are some of the reasons why young people don't receive treatment for anxiety? What are some thoughts on why young people go undiagnosed for anxiety disorders? Yeah, a lot of times it looks like something else. That's, a, that's, that's true. Misdiagnosed. Yeah, sometimes we might look at it as defiance. Very good. So one reason for that might be that anxiety symptoms are so variable, right? They might look very different for different people. Um, kids with generalized anxiety often feel overwhelmed with worry, and some have physical symptoms such as headaches or stomach aches. Others have intense social phobia that prevent them from doing things like going to birthday parties or practicing in extracurricular activities. So often parents, teachers, and even some healthcare professionals don't realize the severity of anxiety symptoms or recognize that it should be treated. So oftentimes it just goes unrecognized or we might not think that the young person needs treatment. There is the idea that kids will outgrow these problems related to anxiety. 
but the evidence doesn't support that. So we definitely want to treat anxiety symptoms because we don't tend to outgrow those, right? Like any other mental health disorder, the longer we live with those symptoms, the more impactful and the more severe it becomes. And so getting treatment as early as possible is going to be helpful in treating the disorder and also in reducing the, the symptoms of it. So there is healthy and unhealthy anxiety. So anxiety can be a healthy and adaptive response to danger that keeps us safe, right? We know that oftentimes um, we are very cautious with things. So for example, we might get a little anxious when we look down if we are in a high storage building, in a high level building, right? If we look down, we might notice and we might feel some level of anxiety. So some of that response in our body is typical and important because it, it helps us and it keeps us safe. However, anxiety becomes unhealthy when it does not subside over time and impairs the normal day-to-day -day functioning of you. So when we try to identify the difference between healthy and unhealthy anxiety, we want to keep in mind how impactful it is and how long have we been feeling this way, right? So the duration and the impact is what helps us identify the difference between um, healthy and unhealthy. And anxiety can have profound impact on learning. So most mental health disorders begin during adolescence, especially anxiety, it oftentimes begins during middle and high school. And so it can severely, anxiety symptoms can severely impact um, student learning. So there are three forms of student anxiety. You probably have heard some of this in the past. One of the most common um, student anxiety is school refusal. Um, so it's one of the most obvious signs of student anxiety is referred to as school refusal or school phobia. This is when the student will go to great lengths to avoid school in every sense. School refusal can look like losing touch with their regular social circles dropping out of extracurricular activities, skipping classes, and refusing to go to school. In severe cases of student anxiety, school refusal can be serious, can be so serious that it can lead to that student dropping out of school temporarily or permanently. So school, refu school refusal might be one thing you hear often, right? The, the student, the youth doesn't want to go to school. Um, they might even um, feel sick. So when I used to work in the schools, there might be students who on Monday they develop headaches, develop stomach aches, um, went through great lines to, sh to appear sick so they don't have to go to school. And it's very common. And we're going to talk a little bit about treating for school refusal a little bit later. The next type of student anxiety is test anxiety. And this is a type of performance anxiety. Test anxiety often goes hand in hand with learning issues. So children who have ADHD or a learning disability often feel anxious about school, which makes sense, right? If we have ADHD or we have a learning disability, the concept of taking a test can um, intensify our anxiety. And this might be due to maybe the limited amount of time to take a test or knowing that we process information a little bit slowly and so the idea of taking a test at times can lead to heightened anxiety. Um, and we tend to see this a lot when we have young people who either have already a learning disability or ADHD. And the last one is social anxiety. Um, and this one oftentimes begins by the age of 13. And social anxiety um, is associated with social interactions. So for example, a student with social anxiety disorders may suddenly stop engaging with friends, and social activities altogether. Um, they may start to find excuses to why they can't make plans with others. This, this is especially difficult for youth because social interaction is so crucial around this age group. Um, and you might start to notice the young person may be no longer wanting to take place in any extracurriculum activity. You might notice um, if you're a teacher in the classroom, you might notice a young person try their hardest to avoid getting cold out or um, feel really uncomfortable when there's group work. Um, I know that when I was in school, social anxiety was something that I experienced and it was really hard. Um, it's often perceived by others as you being um, rude or careless. Um, and so it can be really hard in the young person to have that experience. 
So there are other common anxiety disorders in youth and in adults. You might have heard some of these already. So we have panic disorders, which might include sudden and intense fearfulness, um, fear of dying or losing control. And then there's also some physical symptoms to panic disorders. So we might feel dizziness, shortness of breath, and racing heart. Sometimes you might also notice people talking about um, feeling like they're going to die. So it's a very intense fear. Um, not everyone who has anxiety disorders might experience a panic disorder. And also we might experience a panic attack without necessarily having an anxiety disorder. Um, so they oftentimes don't go in hand, hand with hand. But a panic disorder um, is something that is related to having multiple panic attacks. Then we have social anxiety, which we talked a little bit about. It's really associated with uh, social situations. Sometimes it could even include speaking in front of others. Then we have generalized anxiety disorder, which is a general fear or worry. And it could include this inability to relax. So kind of often being on edge. There's also some physical elements to that, such as chest pain, headache, fatigue, muscle tension, or vomiting. Um, especially in youth, when we notice general anxiety in younger, younger youth, like middle school, we might even see a lot of vomiting or stomach aches. Um, so a lot of physiological symptoms with that. And the last one is post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is triggered by a traumatic event. And trauma is the number one risk factor for mental health disorders. So if we know a young person who's experienced a traumatic event, we just want to be mindful because we know that this can oftentimes um, lead to a mental health disorder. So the more we can provide support for the young person, the more likely they are to, the more likely we are to prevent the onset of a mental illness. So here are the signs and symptoms. Here's some things that we might be able to notice, right? If we are concerned about a young person, a, a teenager, a student, here's some of the signs and symptoms we can recognize. So the first thing we might notice is some emotional changes. So this can include feeling irritated, having difficulty concentrating. So the student may also feel restless and may act out in unexpected ways to avoid a situation they perceive as threatening. So for example, a student might purposely get kicked out of class before a quiz if they have test anxiety. Right? So the, there's an emotional response to anxiety. Um, we also have some social changes, which we've already talked about social anxiety, but I think it's important to mention in this case that in some severe cases of social anxiety, um, youth may develop selective mutism. And this is um, something that we want to be helpful. We want to be mindful as educators. If we notice some of these signs and symptoms, uh, especially when it comes to social, social changes, we don't want to perceive them as a young person being disobedient. Um, instead, we wanna make sure that we help the person get some professional help. Then there's physical changes that come with that as well. Um, and we've talked about some of the physical changes, but one thing to keep in mind is that it's crucial to look for patterns rather than jumping to conclusions right away. So for example, I mentioned earlier, right? If you notice a young person, a student who comes into the class every day when there's a test and they misbehave to get kicked out of the classroom. Right, so those patterns in their in their behavior. If you notice, like I said earlier, there was a student who maybe every time before a test had a stomach ache or um, was um, complaining about stomach aches and wanted to go see the nurse. So just kind of keeping in mind what might be some of those patterns that the young person is displaying. Some physical changes also include headaches, dizziness, sweating, body or muscle aches, nausea or upset stomach, excessive fatigue and changes in diet and unexplained illnesses. Um, you might also notice with anxiety, you can see some um, self-driven eating disorders because of anxiety. So sometimes anxiety can go hand in hand with eating disorders. Sleep disturbance is also a sign or symptom of anxiety, right? We know that young people need eight to 10 hours of sleep. I think adults need that too, but we just can't get that. Um, but young people really need those hours of sleep because it helps them with brain development. Um, but oftentimes when a young person is experiencing anxiety, it can affect their sleep habits. So this might be having trouble falling asleep. This might mean staying asleep longer. Um, 
nightmares and waking up still feeling tired. Um, so a lot of these things can impact um, those, those um, symptoms of anxiety as well, right? So if we're not getting enough sleep, it can intensify all of the other symptoms that we've talked about before. Another thing to keep in mind with, with, this, uh, with sleep disturbance is that we also wanna be mindful of patterns in the young person's behavior. So maybe something's happening. Again, is the young person having more nightmares or more difficult falling asleep during the school week? Or is this something that, that's happening during the weekend? Are there specific things that might lead to that? Maybe a young person who has social anxiety might not be able to sleep before um, having to give a presentation or before taking a test. So just being mindful of those patterns. Um, other signs and symptoms that you might notice in school is poor school performance, right? Children who feel well, do well. So when a, young, when a student is not performing well in school, that's a warning sign. It can be a warning sign of anxiety as well as many other things. We talked about panic attacks already. We talked about school refusal. Um, another common sign and symptom is tantrums. And we don't often associate tantrums with anxiety. So I think it's really helpful to be mindful of this because children or young or students might express their anxiety through their behaviors, right? So they might throw a tantrum before being dropped off of school. Um, and this might be a sign of separation anxiety. A student might also act out in a class so, they can, so that they can avoid an uncomfortable situation like taking a test or giving a presentation. Um, we might associate tantrums more with with younger kids, right? So middle school, but we might also see tensions um, more expressed in behavioral um, during high school as well. And then obsession with perfection. We oftentimes overlook this warning sign, and I think it's one of the most important ones when we think about, when we think about anxiety. Um, and this involves the youth constantly worrying about being perfect and putting pressure on themselves to never make a mistake. An obsession with perfection is very unhealthy and can extremely deter detrimental and can be extremely detrimental to the student's well-being and self-esteem. So we think about, we oftentimes blame um, or think it's the parents' fault that the young person is being um, obsessed with perfection, but oftentimes the self-inflicted. So the young person has this, their own kind of idea of what perfect looks like and what it needs to be. And it can really, really impact the young person's self-esteem. And lastly, we have pessimism, right? So um, that's another sign in which the student assumes the worst. So um, this can be really hurtful and oftentimes it might mean like, why would I try that if I'm going to fail? Or what's the purpose of me getting a good grade? if I'm never going to get into the college of my dreams. So it's kind of the idea of the glass half and empty as opposed to um, half full. So there's things that we can do to support youth who might be either showing some of these signs and symptoms. Um, I always say, right, when we think about any mental illness, they can be mild, moderate, or severe, right? So. Some people might have mild levels of social anxiety where it might be really difficult to engage, but once they start engaging, they're able to kind of be successful at that. Whereas others, it is so difficult to engage. The idea of engaging on a behavior can lead to a lot of physiological symptoms, like headaches, stomach aches, vomiting, diarrhea. And so we always wanna keep in mind the severity and also keep in mind that for some use, it could be, um, easier to overcome some of these anxieties, whereas for others, it might require some professional help. Um, and as educators, as, as individuals in the helping profession, we can help um, kind of assess what level of severity are these symptoms, right? And there's some things that we can do to help ourselves. And then we're gonna talk about when to seek professional help. So a lot of you mentioned earlier, when you talked about your self-care, you mentioned mindfulness. Um, and I know that that's like a, a hip word, we use mindfulness for everything, but we know that mindfulness when practiced on a regular basis can be really helpful for anxiety, right? So what that means is that we wanna teach young people to practice mindfulness when they're not feeling high levels of anxiety. I oftentimes when I work with young adults or kids, I told them, you know, I want you to practice mindfulness 
every day, like after you brush your teeth or after you do a daily um, habit so that it becomes part of your routine. And once it's part of your routine, it takes action when you're feeling anxious, right? It, takes, it starts working when you're feeling anxious. And I'm gonna give you some helpful tips on how to practice mindfulness in a little bit. Um, other things that we can do um, as educators, if possible, we wanna provide some accommodations. So what might that look like? Accommodations might look like um, giving the young person extra time to take the test, right? If they have test anxiety. It might mean keeping in mind, where do we sit the, the young person in the classroom, the, the, the student in the classroom? Do, does he feel better if he sits um, in a corner, in the back, in the front of the room? So thinking about some of those accommodations can be really helpful. Um, we might also provide a quiet place for the young person um, to take a test or to write their papers. And then one thing that oftentimes is suggested as well is allowing the young, the, the student or the youth to gradually face their fear situation. So it's important to remember that the best way to overcome anxiety is by, the best way to overcome our fears is by facing those fears. And with anxiety, that is one of the best ways of treatment is kind of um, facing the fear situation. And so when possible and with some guidance, we want to encourage the young person to face those fear situations. And that's when we think about school refusal, the last thing we want to do is play into the young person not wanting to go to school, right? Because that kind of intensifies the fear that if you go to school, something bad happens. Um, so we want to be really mindful with that. We also want to take the students' concerns seriously. You know, what, what's going on with the young person if they are having some level of test anxiety, how can we support them? What is, why is that happening? Um, if they're having some social anxiety, what are some things that we can do to support them? Um, so taking those concerns seriously. I always encourage people to, oftentimes anxiety disorders or depression or any other mental health disorder, oftentimes expressed in behavior. So acting out, um, uh, you know, distracting the classroom. And so keeping in mind that these could be warning signs and maybe not necessarily a situation of testing the limit. We also want to collaborate with parents and guardians, right? As teachers and educators, we want to make sure that we get the parents involved. We want to kind of get an idea of how the, the student or the youth behaves in the ha at, at home, if they have similar behaviors at home. Um, as teachers and educators, we also are crucial in getting appropriate diagnosis for young people. And so earlier when we talked about what might be some barriers in seeking help for those professionals, we talked about you know, not being able to identify those symptoms or not being able to get help. And so when we work with students every single day, we get to recognize their behaviors, we get to know them. And so teachers take a big part in the appropriate diagnosis for youth whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, or any other mental health disorder. And we want to connect with a mental health professional if necessary, right? So we want to normalize mental illnesses. We want to normalize anxiety. We know that this is something that, can, that we can all experience at some point in our lives. For some, we can overcome it. For others, we might need some support. And so not only do we want to connect the young person to those professionals, but as as individuals who connect with those young people, we want to normalize it and let them know that it is okay to seek help. And sometimes seeking help is going to make us feel better. Just like with the physical illness, right? If we have a cold, if we have, um, you know, uh, asthma, we oftentimes have to go talk to a doctor so that they can provide us with the best treatment for those things. The same thing happens with the mental illness. So the more we normalize it, the more likely we are to encourage people to seek help not only for the youth, but even for the parents who can also have some stigmas around mental illnesses. So I talked about reducing stress through breathing and mindfulness, right? So this is a type of mindfulness that I really enjoy. I think we can do it at any point in our day. Um, and this is called square breathing. Basically what we do is that um, we do, you know, we inhale, through our nose and we count to four. Then we hold in our lungs and we count to four. Then we blow out slowly and we count to four. 
and then we hold um hold your lungs empty and we count to four right and so this this doesn't take too long it's helpful and we know that when we breathe in oxygen to our brains we change the way our brain is functioning we bring in some we bring in some fresh oxygen and so it can really help us feel calmer so square breathing can be something we can implement with youth at any point during the school day or even at home other types of mindfulness can be focused stretching so stretching your body mindfulness and, and focusing it on different areas of your body um, another helpful is progressive muscle relaxation so basically what that looks like is you're going to ask the young person to kind of put pressure in all of their body and progressively start reducing it. And so you might say, okay, let's progressively stop reducing the, the force through our legs and let go slowly and then up your stomach and then through your arms and then lastly through your face. And the idea is to relax all your muscles. And the last thing I've I've oftentimes suggested for people, and this can work for any age young youth, is um, a calm down corner. So as opposed to using time out or any other kind of um, ways to manage behavior, creating a calm down corner in the house or in the, in the school um, or in the classroom where we just allow the young person who is overstimulated, who might be experiencing a lot of feelings, to go to a corner and just calm down. And it's more about changing our language, right? When we say time out, that's, that's kind of negative words. When we say calm down, that's telling us what we need to do, right? Let's calm down, let's take some breath. So um, calm down corners can be really helpful. And there's a lot of resources on how we might just develop some calm down corners by putting together some um, posters that talk about mindful breathing, some posters with how we're feeling, um, putting things to help us relax, like a, a squishy ball, um, a fidget, fidget tool, um, and just allowing the young person or the kid to sit in the calm down corner for a few minutes so that they can collect themselves. All of those can be really helpful, especially when anxiety, we know that it kind of triggers our nervous system. So those calm down corners can be really useful. All right, so here's some other ways that we can help youth who experience anxiety. So the first thing we wanna do is help reduce the triggers. So what that means is we won't be able to solve all of the young person's problems, but there's things that we can do to accommodate them and help them reduce um, their symptoms of anxiety. So what that might look like is if the young person feels very anxious um, after school, we might just allow them to take a few hours or a few minutes to calm down before they go on to their um, household routine, right? Whether it is um, do their homework. So we might say, okay, when you come home from school, you're gonna be able to relax for 30 minutes and then after that, you'll start your homework, right? So just allow the young person to let you know how we can help them and how we can help reduce those triggers. Remind them that they don't have to be perfect, right? Um, like I said before, the, the students and the and youth tend to put that pressure on themselves. So we kind of want to frequently remind them that no one's perfect and that we don't expect them to be perfect. Um, you know, so perfectionist, perfectionism drives feelings of worry and anxiety. While setting appropriate expectations is a good thing, reminding the teen that they don't have to be perfect might help them to relax in life and learn a healthy way to achieve their goals. Um, the next thing is encourage them to engage in healthy outlets. Um, and I always like to say healthy outlets is really important, right? One thing that I often recommend is exercise. Whatever level of exercise. Exercise is a very helpful, natural remedy for anxiety and depression. So whether that is running in place for a couple of minutes, doing jumping jacks, um, walking your dog, right? It doesn't have to be intense interval training it can just be something that allows their body to move something to burn out some energy um, so exercise can be really helpful and, and it could be a healthy outlet when when thinking about engaging in healthy outlets i also encourage you to let a young person decide 
what might be healthy uh, for them, right? Because we might know some things that are healthy for us, but we don't necessarily know what the young person might enjoy. So giving them options and letting them choose um, could be really helpful. Also, allow the young person to vent when needed. Um, I don't know about you all, but sometimes when I'm very stressed and I have a lot of things going on, the situation feels a lot worse in my mind. So when we allow the young person to vent and talk about their problems out loud, they might start to recognize that the situation is not as big as they thought it would be. So it can be really helpful. Um, we can also empathize, right? Empathize and share about our own anxiety and fears. So when we think about empathizing, it's just letting the young person know that, you know, what they're feeling is real. Um, so that goes along with, I think Frank just mentioned they need validation. Absolutely. When we think of empathizing, we think of validating their feelings, understanding that their feelings are real. And sometimes it can be helpful to share about our own anxiety and fears. I would be mindful about this, right? Because we don't want to make the situation about ourselves. But it can be helpful to normalize anxiety for some youth, that they're not the only ones feeling this way, that other people have also felt anxious, that other people also feel fear. Um, and that can help normalize those feelings um, and even help the young person talk a little bit more about their feelings. Another way to help the youth is to stay calm, right? So we want to stay calm when, when the young person is anxious. So if you have a person who might be experiencing a panic attack, we want to make sure that we don't meet them at their same level. Um, I always like to say, right, um, we want to be the safety net for them. So that means staying calm, keeping your tone of voice low, again, using those positive words, such as stay calm, sit down, right, things that maybe indicate action, as opposed to saying uh, you're not in danger, right, because those things can, can be more, it can sound more negative and scary. So just using those positive words. And then we talked about incorporating relaxing activities into your daily life, right? And that's why from the get-go in this presentation, it talks so much about our own self-care. Um, and we want to make sure that we model that for youth, whether that is at home, if we're a parent, whether that is at school, if we're a teacher, we want to make sure that we're modeling those behaviors for youth. So even in ourselves, when we notice ourselves getting triggered or being overwhelmed, just saying like, I need a minute to breathe, right? I need to count my own breath. I need to do my four square breathing. And if they notice that we're modeling that for them, they're more likely to practice that themselves. And lastly, explore, right? Sometimes it may require exploring what are other options. If the young person is not able to manage those symptoms on their own, if we are not able to help them as their parents or their teachers, then it's really helpful to explore and see if it would be helpful to talk to a therapist. Um, and there's a lot of stigma about seeking help for mental illnesses, um, but we want to kind of talk about what that looks like and help young people make some choices and decisions on how they would like to get help for their, for their anxiety symptoms. So now let's talk a little bit more about uh, managing anxiety during reopening. And when we think about during reopening, we're thinking about this school year, which is going to look very different than any other school year, right? Because we're opening in the midst of a pandemic. There is so much uncertainty and um, we are filled with information about COVID-19 via our television, social media feeds, our email inboxes. And it's no wonder we're all feeling higher levels of anxiety recently. And so we want to be mindful of that and notice the fact that we are also feeling anxious as parents, as educators, as social workers, um, with how to handle COVID-19. Um, it's, it's been months now that we're living in these uncertainty. So we want to be mindful that we are experiencing some levels of anxiety. Um, but we also want to be, be mindful that we already have some skills on how to manage stress. Um, and so we can utilize some of those skills that we have learned through our lives in dealing with the reopening of schools this year and dealing with the uncertainty of what the school year is gonna look like in the midst of COVID-19, um, in the midst of all, of all of the social injustice 
that's happening in the world. So we want to be mindful of that and recognize that this is creating anxiety, not only for ourselves, but also for um, the youth, right? For kids and youth and our kids. So how do we manage anxiety? So the first thing is focus on what you can control, right? We cannot control everything, but there are certain things that we can control. And the most helpful thing we can do in this situation is practice acceptance acceptance that we don't have control over everything and that we can just focus on the things that we can control. So that might look like, I often tell um, my parents, that might look like start preparing just for week one or just focus on day one, right? Like what is the first day of school going to look like? Um, as opposed to thinking about what's gonna happen if schools close up or what's gonna happen in three months, right? So just focus on the first day, just focus on the, fir on the first week, and also prepare for the future. So have a place in the home that is ready for school at home. Um, help the, let the young person choose what their school, um, school, their home school will look like, right? So where do you want your school desk to be at? Where, what would you like to add to, um, to your, your home school? area whether that is some posters whether that is they want to have um, different color papers or pens so you know those are things that we can control creating a safe space at the house for the young person and focusing just on the first week same with teachers um, in the schools i've noticed a lot of teachers have the same uncertainty that parents have and the students have and so it's it's kind of the cycle right we just want to focus on the things that we can control the next thing is use skills to access risk, right? We want to assess the risk. So what that means is if your kids, your students, this is mostly for parents. If, you're, if your kids really are craving social interactions and they really need it, then we want to assess risk. So are, the, are their peers willing to wear masks? Are their peers willing to social interact, to socially distance? Are their peers willing to meet somewhere outside. So what is the risk? And does the risk upset, um, if, are, you know, are, are there more pros and cons? And how can we, we make this in a informed, how can we make an informed decision on those things? It's also important to maintain social connections. So in times of extreme stress, people who have solid social support are less likely to feel traumatized and overwhelmed, right? So it, I know that it's happened to all of us. We, we disconnected from our social circles when, when COVID started, but I think it's time for us to start reconnecting. And that might be through, um, through FaceTime, through virtual sessions or meetings, or it can be in person with certain cautions, right? But it's really, really important to start to social, to, to maintain your social connections. And the same thing with youth. So many students, when the schools closed, their main issue was, I miss my friends. I miss connecting. I miss my teachers. So how do we maintain those social connections? I have seen some schools, and um, this was, uh, I think, kindergarten, where the teacher kind of met with the students in the park and was able to do some activity with the students in the park for once a week, right? So just thinking about how can we be creative in amidst of all of these changes. Be transparent about ground rules. Right, have clear conversations with people. We all um, take different precautions when it comes to COVID-19, and it's not our job to tell people what they need to do, but it is our job to keep ourselves safe. So we wanna make sure that we let people know what we expect from them if we're going to see them, what are some things that we accept, right? So are you willing to wear masks when you can't meet me? Um, are you willing to stay six feet apart right so make sure that we do have those those conversations with our friends with our loved ones even sometimes with with schools or with other people that we interact with and then take breaks take breaks when you need them right as adults we need those breaks especially during these times we want to make sure that if we're starting to feel irritated overwhelmed um, before we snap out we just say hey i need i need a five minute break i need to think through this, I, I need to, you know, kind of go outside and take a walk before I can come back to this situation. 
Um, sometimes we can take breaks, sometimes we can't. Um, and so if we make a mistake, it's okay to come back and say, hey, I'm sorry, I overreacted, it wasn't your fault. I was just feeling a little overwhelmed. And that too can show um, students and kids how to manage difficult conversations or how to fix um, when we hurt someone's feelings. And then don't hesitate to seek help. And we've talked about that. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. Um, here are some, some things that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. We're gonna talk about treatment, um, health promotion, prevention, and mental health literacy. So these are just some, some considerations for all of you, um, and, and mostly for, for all of you who are teachers, um, and maybe you know this already, but it can be helpful to kind of remind yourself as school gets started, right? Who in your school can provide support for youth who might be experiencing some of these symptoms of anxiety? Who are the mental health professionals in your school, right? Maybe this has changed. Um, and I, I don't know if this happens every summer, but it could have changed. And then who can help you make a connection to community agency, right? Oftentimes the reason why we don't seek help is because we don't know where the resources are. So for all of you who are here, I really want you to think about who are those community agencies that can provide resources for, for yourself, for youth, for your friends, kids, right? Because these are really, really important times. And we know that sometimes seeking help can make a big difference in a young person's life. So what to know about treatment? So there's, there's different types of treatment for anxiety, but this is kind of what is um, evidence-based, this is the be best practice, I guess, for anxiety. So psychological treatments, such as talk therapy, are effective and considered to be best line treatment. So talk therapy, one thing I would say about talk therapy is that um, just like anything else, when you go see a doctor, you might go to one doctor and you don't like it, so you need to switch to a different doctor. Don't be afraid to, if something doesn't feel right, if you don't feel like you connect to the therapist, to be open and share that with the therapist, share that with your parents um, and let them know. I see someone talked about CBT. So that's a good type of treatment, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most effective treatments when it comes to anxiety. We also know that medications such as SSRIs can be helpful. Um, and again, I would always say, first of all, check with your primary care provider, check with the professional, and be informed, right? What are best types of treatment? Is treatment working? Can medication help? Just be informed. And allow the young person to, never allow the young person to avoid situations that make them anxious, right? Because sometimes that makes things worse. So I talked a little bit about school anxiety, and so being mindful that we don't want to, um, give in to some of those anxieties for youth because it can only uh, validate that their fears. And then um, anxious kids often have anxious parents, right? So there is some genetic predisposition to anxiety disorders. So what this means is just be mindful. If you're a parent, be mindful of that, right? And, and that should make us more aware of some of those signs and symptoms. And the earlier the young person can get help, the earlier the young person can get treatment, the better the results are. So let's not be afraid to connect those youth to those professionals, right? To those therapists um, and allow them to make some natural connections with those therapists as well. And normalize the idea that if one thing doesn't work, if one type of treatment doesn't work, then they can try something else. So here's some basic goals of treatment, right? What is, what is treatment supposed to do when someone experiences anxiety? Well, mental health treatment um, should improve the symptoms, right? Um, they should also improve the ability to function at home, at work, and at school, and connect with friends. Um, depending on the severity of the anxiety disorder, it can stop the disorder from coming back. Right, like I said before, anxiety can be mild, moderate, or severe. So for some, um, treatment can kind of completely reduce those symptoms. For others, it can use um, treatment can help manage those symptoms, right? And so we want to be mindful of that. And we should never promise a young person, hey, if you get treatment, you're never going to feel this way because we don't know, right? Um, so being really mindful of that. And we always want to 
encourage best um, evidence evidence based treatment, right? We always want to encourage evidence based treatment. So we're talking to a therapist when we're working with a professional. We want to ask, you know, what type of treatments you use, and always be mindful of evidence based treatment. And one of those is cognitive behavioral therapy. And then we have those um, kind of promotions, promoting wellness, right? So those self-help strategies. So I talked about exercise. Exercise can be really helpful. Having a good diet. So for some of us who tend to be um, anxious, we have to be really mindful with our diet, especially when we think about things that include too much caffeine, right? So drinking too much coffee, tea, a lot of sweets, because those things can trigger our nervous system and increase those symptoms of anxiety. Um, so being mindful with that too, with, with um, kids, right? Uh, if they tend to be prone to anxiety, we have to be mindful with their diet. Limit the sugars in their food. I mean, the other day I was looking at my milk and 2% milk has like five grams of sugar. And so things that we, we might think are healthy might not be as healthy. So look for those things in the ingredients too, right? How much sugar does it have? Does it have any caffeine? Because that can affect um, and trigger symptoms of anxiety. We talked about proper sleep hygiene, right? So encouraging you to sleep those eight to 10 hours. And the best way to do that is to have a sleep time routine. And, you know, summer is almost ending for some summer already ended. And so that means your sleep, your bedtime routine has shifted. So instead of going to sleep at 10, right now we're going back to sleeping at nine. And then slowly it's coming back to 8.30 if we think that's appropriate, right? We're really, really encouraging a healthy sleep routine as well. So proper sleep hygiene, we talked about that. And then positive relationships, right? Positive relationships with family and positive relationships with peers. We know that during adolescence, one of their biggest supports are friends. And so as parents, uh, we also might want to consider knowing who their peers are, knowing who their peers' parents are, and making sure that our youth are engaging with positive relationships. So that comes to the end of my presentation. I have some available resources. Um, as you might know, it can be really helpful just to always provide youth with, um, to always provide youth with the hotline number, right? Um, this is the crisis hotline number. If a young person is experiencing too much anxiety, sometimes it might trigger thoughts of suicide. So we always, always wanna have the hotline number available. Also, there's a text line, 741-741. Um, you sometimes feel more comfortable texting. And so these headlines are helpful. They have professionals on the other hand, and they're able to just provide some um, triage, whether it is an emergency and they need to get immediate help or, it's, or they can use other types of support. These headlines are not only for you. If, if you have questions, if you want to get some additional support, you can always say, hey, I don't know how to help or sounds like you're, you're, you're struggling. Um, can we try calling this hotline together? Or can we try texting this, this hotline together? And, and don't be afraid to do those things together or you yourself calling and asking for some help and for some resources. Um, they have a lot of support for those. And I know that it's something that's been utilized a lot during this difficult year. Um, and then I have some helpful apps. Many of you probably have heard of Calm, which is kind of a mindfulness um, app that can be really helpful. We have a worry time app that kind of helps when you're feeling really worried. And then a breathe app, so kind of app, which helps you kind of monitor your breathing. So research shows that individuals who live with anxiety tend to breathe faster which kind of coincides with the lack of oxygen in our brain and a lot of the trigger of our nervous system. And so training ourselves to breathe slowlier and more mindfulness can alleviate some of the symptoms of, mindful, of anxiety as well. And then I have found books to be really helpful in educating um, younger kids on anxiety. 
And so I created a list of some of the books that I like to use with my youth to teach them about anxiety. Um, and it's a variety of different ones. Some of them are about bedtime fears. Other ones are about um, generalized anxiety, selective mutism, OCD, and even post-traumatic stress disorder. And so hopefully this is helpful for all of you as well. And lastly, I have just some references and helpful articles that um, you all might be able to use and maybe read more about. Um, so that's it for my presentation. I hope this was helpful. I think we're gonna open it for some Q&A. Thank you, Angela. That was wonderful. Um, a lot of really good information for uh, professionals and students and educators. So thank you. Unfortunately, we won't have time for everybody's questions today, but we will I mean, keep the questions and um, work to get answers um, to you all uh, in our follow up communication. So if you don't have your question answered today, look for some follow-up from us in the next week or so. So I just wanted to start um, with kind of a broad question um, since we only have time for one or two, Angela. Um, across the nation, children will be attending school in some capacity. Um, how might anxiety be presented now under the pandemic during remote learning and physical attendance at schools? How might it look a little or how might it look right now? That's a really great question. I think we're all going to have a hard time assessing for anxiety virtually, but I would say some of the signs and symptoms will still be the same, right? If you notice that the student maybe not showing up to their class, to their virtual classes, if you notice the student um, not turning in their assignments, right? Um, you might even notice um, students being very honest um, virtually and saying, you know, I'm having a really hard time. I'm not functioning well. And so a lot of those things we talked about on school performance will still take place, noticing their, their grades, noticing how they turn in the, their assignments, and even noticing their appearance. Great, thank you. And just one more um, while we wrap up and then we'll send it back to Anne. Um, what can helping professionals do to reach the parents if the parents also have anxiety? Do you have any suggestions on how to have everybody get connected during this time of being apart? Yeah, so usually I do two things. One, I send parents um, resources via email, right? Like checking, like, hey, I've been working with your, um, with your kid. Here's some resources that you and your kid can go through together. Um, and then another suggestion would be having a parent-child session. That way you get to also get to know the parent and provide them with some resources that might be helpful for them. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to Anne to wrap up our session today. And again, if your questions weren't answered, please be on the lookout for some follow-up information from us and we will ensure that we get you all of the wonderful resources that Angela pro provided today as well. Thank you so much, Angela. This was very informative. Thank you all. Thank you both, Angela and Sarah. This, in fact, was amazing. Um, what I wanted to just let people know is that um, the PowerPoint slides, the recording of this webinar, and other resources will be posted on the Great Lakes MHTTC products and resources page. Um, it'll take us about a week to get all those things up there, so be on the lookout for that. Um, also, you will be getting a um, brief survey. If you could please just take a couple of minutes to fill that out, it would be very helpful to us and we really appreciate it. Um, SAMHSA likes to know how people um, are reacting to our presentations, so that would be great. And if you have any other questions, you can let us know, but we want to thank you all for your time and have a great afternoon.